So uh, I'm Drew. Uh, I'm again a swarm engineer uh, at Docker. And I'm Nishant. I'm also a swarm engineer at Docker. So the rough overview of this presentation, we're going to start with an overview of Swarm, and then we'll dive into some of the new features and improvements we've built, and finally we'll hopefully have some time for questions. All right, so let's begin with an overview. Um, I'm sure you saw the keynote today morning and you saw all the cool things that Swarm can do for you now. And before we begin diving deeper into those features, let's establish a common baseline so that we all are at the same level of knowledge. So let's start with some background. When you run software, you have multiple programs, you maybe run it on a server, but soon enough you want to scale it up and you have multiple servers, you have multiple copies of these programs and so on. And one of the problems this introduces is that you need to decide where to run new programs on. And then the second problem, probably an even bigger one, is that software crashes, hardware goes down all the time. And when that happens, you need to manually figure out where and how to uh, manage or handle these failures. So what is Swarm? Swarm is a tool for cluster orchestration. Swarm takes a bunch of discrete computers and turns them into one single cluster. Swarm simplifies the task of hand architecting your applications and does algorithmic scheduling for you. And finally, Swarm simplifies the task of manual recovery and automatically figures out um, how to recover from failures and when things go down. So Swarm uses an abstraction called a service. And a service is composed of many tasks which are just containers. When you create a service through the CLI or the API, what you're actually creating is something called a service spec. And the spec contains everything that that service needs to run. It has the image name, the number of replicas, ports exposed, environment variables, anything that the containers in that service need. Then we use a, a technique called desired state reconciliation. The way this works is Swarm looks at the actual state of your cluster and compares it to the desired state of the cluster as defined in the service spec. So when you create a service and you ask for three replicas, you're going to see that Swarm is going to see that there are no containers running and you asked for three, so it's going to change the actual state of the cluster and start those three containers. And now the desired state and the actual state are the same, and they've been reconciled. If something changes, a container goes down, or a node goes down, and that causes the container to go down, Swarm sees that as well, and it sees that we've deviated from our desired state of having three containers, and it adds a new one. The Swarm topology is made of two kinds of nodes. The first is the manager. What the manager does is it makes all of the decisions about how and where to run containers. The manager performs this desired state reconciliation. The manager holds these service specs. Now, if you just had one manager, that would be a single point of failure. So instead, managers are a group, and they share data over a distributed systems protocol called Raft, which guarantees that each manager has an identical copy of the data. At any one time, only one manager is actually making the decisions about how to run your cluster. But if it fails, another one of the managers can immediately take over and start making those decisions instead. The restriction here is that strictly more than half of your managers must be active and participating in Raft. The other kind of node is the worker. The worker has one job. It runs containers and reports their status. It makes no decisions, it has no authority. All it can do is run the container and report the status and wait for instructions from the manager. Now, this is the biggest number of nodes you're going to see in this presentation. In a production cluster, three to five managers is typical. Every manager you add adds fault tolerance, but it also increases overhead. However, those three to five managers can manage hundreds or even thousands of worker nodes. So you can run a huge amount of workload on one cluster. So now we're going to get into some new features. We're going to talk about improvements that we've made to Swarm. 
high availability scheduling, the encrypted RAF log, health aware orchestration. And then we're also going to look at some of the features that have been enabled by these improvements, like topology aware scheduling, secrets, service rollbacks, and service logs. Let's talk about high availability scheduling. In a sentence, what this means is we prioritize spreading out the containers in a service instead of trying to equalize the number of containers per node. To illustrate this, let's look at a really common case. We've got two workers, and they're already running some services. And then we add a third. Now, we already have our desired state. We have the correct number of service replicas, and just because we've added this new node and the workload is a little imbalanced, we're not going to reschedule anything. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But let's say we want to schedule a new service with three replicas. How does that get placed? And under the old algorithm, you could end up with something like this. All three replicas of th service three have ended up on the same node. If you got lucky, they could have gotten, one of them could have gotten on worker two, but this is an equally likely case. Because what we were trying to do is balance the absolute number of containers so each node had an approximately equivalent workload. But this is bad because now if worker three fails, it takes down all of service three with it. And you'll have to wait for it to be rescheduled someplace else, and you'll have downtime in the meantime. So under high availability scheduling algorithm, we try and spread out the containers of a service across as many nodes as we can, even if that unbalances the workload a little bit, like we have here. So worker one is running four containers, and worker three is only running one. But this is better because if any of those workers fails, it won't take down the whole service. And what happens if we want to add another replica? How does that get scheduled? That is when the absolute number of containers on each node becomes the tiebreaker. So once we have spread out as much as we can, that's when we start loading work on unloaded nodes. Using high availability scheduling is really simple. You do Docker service create, you create some number of replicas, you use the image, DockerCon, and that's it. If you're using Swarm on Docker greater than 113, you already have high availability scheduling. We replaced the default scheduling algorithm that Swarm shipped with, because this one is strictly better. Now, this leads into something called topology aware scheduling. If we can spread across nodes, why can't we also spread across arbitrary groups of nodes? And we can do that with node labels. You can label nodes. And so let's see another illustration. We have a new service, two replicas, on this swarm with six nodes. And we're going to place them on node one and two, and that's fine. This is a valid placement. Except it's not, because both of these nodes are in the same availability zone. If you work with cloud providers, you know that while it's rare, availability zone failures do happen. And when they do, this could take down your entire application. So instead, what we can do is use something called a placement pref. First, you're going to need to label your nodes. It would be, look something like this. You would repeat for each node, labeling it with the key AZ, availability zone, and the value of what availability zone it's in. Then when you create your service, you use this placement pref flag, and you define the key of the label you want to spread across, and then the value is used to group the nodes into groups. Now you might be thinking, what happens if I have some nodes in my cluster that are unlabeled? All of those unlabeled nodes are going to get their own group when we're spreading across each of the groups of nodes. And so with placement preferences, we can say that both of these containers are guaranteed to end up on different availability zones. So now Nishant is going to come up, and he's going to tell us about some security improvements. Thanks, Drew. So let's talk about some security now. When we released Swarm mode back in uh, DockerCon last year, we decided to encrypt all cluster-wide communication. And we did this because we believe in two things. One is that security should not be an option. And two, to, the easiest way to make sure of that is to make security really easy to use. And we've continued to make improvements along those lines. So let's, um, let's, look at this, um, let's look at this slide here. So remember how you have multiple managers talking to each other using the RAF protocol? 
And the way raft works is that it periodically writes a log to disk. And this is done because this log is needed to recover any failed manager that might go down. Or if your entire cluster goes down, you need it to bring your cluster back up. So what this log contains is a lot of sensitive cluster information, such as service information, environment variables, um, uh, cluster membership, and, and so on. And this log is unencrypted, and that's a problem. So with Swarm, we've made it really easy to encrypt it. And how do you do it? Let's, let's say you start a cluster with Docker Swarm in it, which is the basic cluster create command. And that's it. Your raft log is encrypted by default whenever it's written to disk. But there's a catch. Now, given that you're encrypting communication and the raft log, that means there are encryption keys. And these keys are still un un unencrypted. So if somebody got access to these keys, then they can still technically get into your encrypted raft log and compromise your cluster. So we've taken care of that problem by making it easy to encrypt the encryption keys themselves. The way to do that is to use this new flag called dash dash autolock. And what that does is that it creates a key, and this key is used to encrypt your encryption keys. And then if your manager goes down, or if your entire cluster goes down, then you need this key to bring your manager or cluster back up. What that looks like in practice is something like this. So when you start your cluster using the autolog flag, or you can even update your cluster with the autolog flag, it, it prints out this token. And what this token is, is essentially a key which is used to encrypt your encryption keys. Now it's important to remember here that this token is never saved to disk. It's always in memory while the cluster is running. And it is your job as the operator to make sure that you've saved this token somewhere secure, and if you lose it while, if the cluster goes down, then you will not be able to recover it. You can also do other things like rotate this key after some time or print it out if, um, if you need to see what it looks like while the cluster is running. So now that we've ensured that our raft log is encrypted and our cluster is secure, it gives us more confident. It makes us safer for, for us to store sensitive information in the cluster. A lot of applications use sensitive cluster information, such as um, tokens or passwords or um, credit card data and so on. And it's always a challenging problem to securely send this information to distributed services that are running across multiple machines. A lot of our Docker users have been using various sorts of workarounds in the past. Um, you heard briefly about this in the keynote today morning. Um, environment variables are a re really popular way. And that is fine. I mean, you create a service, you, you use this password as an environment variable, your password is totally secure, and uh, you start your service, and it's all fine until maybe you're debugging it, and you have this debug log that sometimes might have your full environment dumped out to it, might get shared with your uh, cloud provider, and once it's out there, who knows who's gonna look at it. Alternatively, your service might crash, and once that happens, commonly, your environment might get dumped out to this crash log, and it's saved to disk, and that's a bad thing. Yet another common use case is uh, or yet another common way to do this is using persistent volumes. The idea is really simple. What you do is you have persistent volumes, you save your password inside of those volumes, and whenever you need, and you do this on all nodes that you want your service to run on. Service starts, service can read it off the, the volumes, which is again fine until the service crashes, has to be rescheduled to a different node, and now you have this node lying around with a volume, with your password, where it shouldn't be. 
So these methods have problems. They're not fully secure, and we do not want you using them. And this is the reason we've introduced Docker secrets. So Docker secrets are easy to use. They mitigate a lot of the security risks that these other methods carry, and they work seamlessly with Swarm services. So let's see how they work using an example. So here we have a basic Swarm cluster, the one you saw before, with three manager nodes, five worker nodes. The managers are talking to each other using Raft. And this is already secure to begin with because the Raft log is encrypted out of the box. Now, because we are paranoid people, we are going to further auto-lock our cluster using dash dash auto-lock. So now our encryption keys are also encrypted. Now we're confident enough to start a service. So we do that, um, three replicas running on three nodes. And finally, we get to the interesting part. In this case, we want to create a secret which our service will eventually use. It's a password. And the way to do that is Docker secret create. We give it a name, call it my password, and then it gets read off of a file. It gets sent to the manager, gets replicated across to the other managers using the Raft protocol. And because the Raft log is encrypted, the secret cannot really leak out. Finally, we want our service to use the secret, right? And that is also really simple because you just need to update your service. You do a service update, you add your secret, you can refer to it by name, my password, and then update your service, DockerCon. And then one by one, service instances will start getting replaced with updated instances, and each updated instance will have the secret. So one, two, and three. So now we have an updated service, and all of the instances have access to your secret. How do you access the secret from inside the service? Well, it's stored inside a file, and the file is actually in a tempfs, which is mounted into the container. So that means it's never actually written to disk. It's always in memory, and if the cluster goes down, then the secret is lost. It's not going to be written to disk ever. And the other good thing about this is that if your service crashes or an instance of the service crashes or if your worker node goes down and the service instance gets rescheduled, then the secret will move with it and it's not left behind on a node where it shouldn't be. So to summarize and to illustrate how easy it is to create and distribute secrets in a distributed environment now, you seek, create a secret using secret create, give it a name, and then update your service to use it, and that's it. So let's move on to the next improvement that we've made, health aware orchestration. So last year we released container health checks, where you could check the health of your container while it was running. And what a health check is, is basically a command and this command is run periodically, and depending on how many times it's failing, a container might be marked unhealthy. So in this example, you can see it's just, the command is just curling an endpoint, a local endpoint, and it's going to be run every 10 seconds, and if it fails after five retries successively, then your container is marked as failed or unhealthy. You can also do this via the command line, by the way. But the cool thing is now that Swarm can take these health checks into account while making orchestration decisions. The way that works is you have a service instance running on this worker here. The worker will periodically send uh, health information about this service to the manager. It indicates that the service is running healthy. Now if the service starts failing the health check, then the manager will know about it and then the manager will decide to shut this instance down and then restart it somewhere else or maybe on the same node. The important distinction to make here though is that the container could still be running. It does not need to have crashed. It's just unhealthy and the manager knows about either case. So it gets rescheduled in this case to other node and 
the worker says that this is healthy. So we're good. So now Drew will come back up and talk about new features we've added to service rollbacks. So service rollbacks. This is really simple, but it's really cool. Uh, now you can roll the service back to the previous spec. And you can do this two ways. You can do it manually through a service update by passing the rollback flag, or you can do it automatically as a rollback failure action. So, there we go. Uh, so let's say we create this service. Um, we're gonna name it DockerCon. It's gonna have 1845 replicas, publishing port 80, and the image is Texas. 1845 is the year Texas was founded. <laughs> uh, and so, of course, we create this service object in Swarm, and desired state reconciliation happens, and you get all the copies of this, uh, all the copies of this container on your cluster, and then let's say we want to update it to something new. Uh, Docker service update, we published 2017 replicas. Uh, the image is now DockerCon, because that's what's important. And we add port 443, because this is the 21st century, and we use TLS. And so that's going to become the new active spec, and this is going to get reconciled in the cluster. But we retain a reference to that previous spec. And that's important, because when you do rollback, you don't have to remember any of the changes you made when you updated this service. We save the previous spec, and we just go straight back to it automatically. So the rollback happens, and now we have the correct, the, the previous spec. Now note, after you do a rollback, the previous spec is of course the spec that you just came from. So when you do a rollback, it swaps the current spec and the previous spec. So you, if you roll back a rollback, you end up back where you were before. We don't save like an infinite list of specs going all the way back to the beginning of time. So now let's talk about automatic rollbacks as part of rolling updates. We launched Docker Swarm with rolling updates. And these first two rolling update modes were launched with the product. This is an example of what a successful rolling update looks like. So the blue container represents our initial spec, our initial revision. The yellow container represents a container that's being restarted. And the green container represents the new revision. And a rolling update says we're going to update these and wait until the next one is ready, and then the next one is ready, so that at any given time, we don't have this downtime where no container is active. So your service can keep going. Now, if your service fails, then the first action you can take is continue. And continue says, just keep rolling out the failed service. So even if the service fails, just keep rolling out the broken instance. And this might sound silly, but it's useful for some cases. For instance, what if your service depends on some third party to bootstrap itself, and that third party is not active, and it can't bootstrap? You know that that failure is going to be transient, and so continuing would be a valid choice. The other option is to pause, and pause just says when a failure occurs, stop updating. Wait for an operator to intervene and give us some instructions on what we're supposed to do. And now the final mode is rollback. And all rollback does is whenever we encounter a failure, we go back to the previous version of the spec. So you might be wondering, what happens if my rollback fails? For example, what happens if I do rely on this external service to bootstrap? and it's still not active. We know it's going to fail again. Does your rollback get rollbacked? And does the failed rollback of the rollback of the rollback get rollback? No. With, <laughs> with rollbacks, you only have two failure options. You either pause or continue. And you set that through the rollback failure action flag. Pause or continue. So we can't end up in this infinite loop of rolling back. So now Nishant's gonna come back on and he's gonna tell us about some of the ways we can tune these updates. All right, so now that we understand how, um, how we take care of updates failing with uh, update failure modes, we need, to be, we need to have a way to tune these updates. Why do we need that? So if you look at Drew's example, you know, we, we consider the update failing if one instance of the service fails and that's it. But in practice, applications can be flaky. And if you're running 100 replicas, maybe you don't really want your update to fail if you know just one or two instances are failing because maybe they'll come back up, maybe you're, um, you don't really have downtime because of that. And so 
Keeping that in mind, we've introduced this new flag called update max failure ratio. And what this does is that it allows you to specify a fraction um, such as 0.1, 10%. And it says that only if more than 10% of my updated instances are failing, then count my service update to have failed. Anything less, I'm fine. And along similar lines, the other flag we have is called update monitor period. And the idea there is that sometimes services can fail during an update because it's an update issue, and then sometimes they might fail later for unrelated reasons. And you want to be able to distinguish between that. So for an update monitor period of 10 seconds, your service instances will be monitored for up to 10 seconds after update, and if they fail within that time, then those failures will be counted towards an update failure. Anything after that, not. So we'll see an example for, to sort of get an idea of how this works. We have this service with 100 replicas. We are going to update 10 instances at a time, and we've set update failure ratio to 10%, and we have a monitoring period of 10 seconds. So the update starts. The first 10 instances are primed for update. Turns out that four of them have failed. And now we have the next 10. Turns out four more have failed. And this is already starting to look like a bad update. Maybe your developers have left some bugs in there. And when you update the next 10, four more have failed. And that's beyond your threshold. So we need to take action. This update has failed, and we need to roll it back, because that's what we asked it to do. So it's going to roll back, again, 10 instances at a time. And finally, until it's back to the original version, which was running fine. And these flags also work for pause and continue, not just rollback. So the final part of our talk is service logs, which Drew will again talk about. When you're trying to get logs from the services in a cluster, it's a little more complicated than just getting logs from a container. Because the containers you're trying to get logs from could be on any machine anywhere. And you might try some workarounds. You might try maybe SSHing into all of the nodes. Uh, if you're really savvy, you might try this horrid bash one-liner where you list all your nodes, and you SSH into them, and then you list all your services, and you find the ones you want, and then you send them all back as no. Uh, the other thing you might do is you might set up a logging system with Docker's log drivers, and that's a really good idea. But what if you just need the logs quickly for debugging? Something is failing, or you're trying to see what the log output is, and you just need it right now. So that's what service logs are. Service logs are a way to fetch all of the logs from all of the containers in your service as one stream. And this includes logs from stopped containers. So you can see the entire log output of a container through its whole life. This uses the same API options and wire format that container logs uses. So existing tools that can work with container logs can also parse service logs. But it also sends the context of the logs, so the service, the node, and the task IDs that that container is part of, as part of the details of the log message, as and on each log line, so that you can distinguish what each log line comes from. Here's an example of the output of this command. We do Docker service logs. We do a tail of 10. We only want the last 10 lines on the service DockerCon. And then I'm cheating a little bit and piping to sort. But there's a good reason for this. In a distributed system like Swarm, it's extremely difficult or impossible to coordinate message order across many different machines. You have issues like clock skew, and you have issues like some nodes may take a few more milliseconds to respond. And so when we return your logs, they come back from each container in order, but the interleaving and shuffling of them, we don't make any guarantees about. We don't try and sort it. So you can use an external utility and put them in like date order like I have here. So the log model is really simple, but it's really cool. A log request comes into the manager, and the manager generates what are called subscriptions. And the subscription contains all of the information that a worker needs to fulfill that log request. It contains all of the services that you're asking for and any options we need to pass down into container logs. Then inside the worker, 
it starts container logs on each of the containers in the service and combines all of them into a single stream that goes back to the manager. The manager gets all of these streams and then returns all of them combined as a single stream back to the client. So we take all of these disparate container logs and put them all into one stream. So that's the end of our talk. Uh, Nishant, we're going to recap what we have so far. All right, who's counting how many times we switched? <laughs> all right, so let's summarize what we have so far and what we talked about today. We've made a lot of improvements. We've added some new features to Swarm. It's really powerful, it's really secure, and it's really easy to use. So the first thing we talked about was scheduling, where high availability scheduling is now default. You're already using it out of the box. And that enables topologically aware scheduling, which is also really easy to use. The next improvements are in security, where your RAF log is encrypted by default, you can encrypt your encryption keys, and you can really, really easily use Docker secrets to distribute sensitive information. The third set of improvements is in orchestration, where we've now enabled health-aware uh, orchestration, where your manager can keep track of the health status of your containers. And we have new features for rolling updates. We've, we've given you more options, more ways to tune them. And then finally, we have service logs, where, which is the recommended and the simplest way of getting aggregate logs about your running services. So that was our talk. Thank you for coming. And <laughs> all right, all right. So, so this is the largest audience that Drew and I have spoken in front of. And before we start taking questions, we need to do something really important. We need to take a Docker selfie. Perfect. Oh, I, oh, we should have the other half too. You're right. You're right. <laughs> oh. Even the pixel doesn't have a front panorama. No, it probably some. does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we give them another um, round of applause, please? <laughs> yeah, who else is excited now to debug using service logs? Anyways, um, so we have questions. So if you want to come here and line up. And we can start passing the mic around. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hey, uh, my name's Darren from Appfolio. I had a question about um, swarm and kind of like fault tolerance or fault isolation. So, like, let's say you had a uh, hundred worker nodes, and for fault isolation reasons, um, you wanted to divide them into fifty swarms of size two. Does that Sound crazy, workable, what, what problems would I hit? So you're saying like you have all of these nodes and you want, you want to group them by twos? Yeah. Just add, you can just add node labels to them yep. and use that, those placement preferences anytime you deploy a service and that will tell you to spread across these pairs as one of, and placement preferences don't just work one level. You can have like any number of levels of divisions. So you yep. can divide not just by availability zone, but by data center. So you can, anything you can do with topology with that spread across these labels, you can do like this. Okay. The, Let's the say only overhead you need to die. think about is how much load each of these zones is going to take. So the less nodes you have in each, the less load it's going to be able to take. Okay. So I, so I kill the managers. Okay. You, you killed the managers? Yes. I want, I want essentially like swarms of size two to be autonomous. Like oh, oh, totally coming. autonomous? Yes. That's a different problem entirely. Yeah. Okay, yep. <laughs> yeah. And one so that, that I do not have an answer for. Okay, yeah. so, so what like problems would I hit essentially running like 50 swarms in my data center? The managing Unknown. 50 swarms. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the problem. Okay. Uh, we, so it's workable, there's no sort of like yeah. The, yeah. The, the Inherent idea of, problem to that. The idea of managing multiple such um, orchestrated clusters uh, together is the problem of cluster federation. And that's a different problem, one which is possibly um, out, it's out, out of, of the scope. future. Yeah, it's out of scope for Swarm itself yeah. right now in this presentation. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, not, I'm not expecting any kind of coordination. Yeah. I just want to know if, like, if that's possible. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. possible. Great. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hey guys, uh, I'm Peter. Um, I'm going to cheat and ask you two questions, but hopefully one of them is very quick. Um, so the service logs, is that log driver dependent? Um, so service logs leverages container logs. And so if you're using a log driver, I believe it's uh, journal D or, or JSON log. I can't remember offhand. Right. But if you're using one of the log drivers that's compatible with container logs, you can get service logs. Okay. If you're not, if it's one of the log drivers that does not support container logs, then at this time we cannot get the logs from a service. Right, right. So I guess uh, in my case, like I'm using um, the syslog driver okay. to, to, as a lazy way of pushing to Logstash. Um, which I guess doesn't can, doesn't support. The, I think the, Syslog actually might. It's either Syslog it? or Journal D, and I, I can't remember offhand. Uh, I might be a couple of versions. Yeah. <laughs> um, See, so yeah, the other question I had was about the, the secret storage. Right? Is that stored in the raft log or so physically? Though? I mean, is it stored anywhere physically, or is it just in mem? Right. So the way this works is that the the secret is generally in memory. And as I said, when, when you're talking about the service instances which are using the secret, sure. in that case, it is uh, in a file which is in the tempfs, which is mounted into the container. Okay. And so that's always in memory. Right. Now, as far as Raft is concerned, the secret is replicated using Raft. So because we've made the decision to also encrypt the Raft log by sure. default, the secret cannot leak out. And, and the secret in this case, the raft log is written to disk. The raft log yeah. is a log of the entire cluster state. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the secret is part of that cluster state. So the, the only place the secret is written to disk is as part of this raft log. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was just looking, wondering if there was any attack vector there. But I guess in a, when it's encrypted, it's not a big deal. Okay. That, yeah. was, that was me. Right. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to go follow up on that secrets uh, uh, question. So is there any way of migrating secrets from one swarm cluster to another? You can't like connect to like different manager sets and have them exchange data. It, that's kind of weird. But you can yeah. just get your secret like from a file and just put it on a different swarm cluster. I'm just talking just a normal when you do, for example, if you go to the standard blue green upgrade or any other way. So I'm bringing up a completely new swarm cluster and I want to redeploy the, the service I have there. But I don't necessarily have the secrets anymore, and I don't want our cloud ops um, to care about the secrets. Right. So I just want to migrate from the previous Swarm cluster to the new one. Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure how to answer I'm, that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure of the answer to that. But if your cluster, new cluster is similar to the old one, or you're just trying to bring the old one back up uh, using the old log, then you could do that, and your secrets will be accessible because they're part of the log. But I, I'm not sure, and uh, I don't want to promise, but I don't know if there's a way to directly export secrets to a different um, Docker engine or a manager running as part of a different cluster. I, I believe there isn't. No. No. Yeah. That would be a nice feature. <laughs> By design, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, uh, this wasn't in your talk, but. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, I wanted to use Swarm a while back for a, a project I was doing, and the one thing that really hit me was uh, that the application I'm using needs to have at least one node where the name is known, and the other nodes need to be named predictably. Let's say prefix one, two, three, four, something like that. Is, is anything changed in Swarm about the ability to name the nodes that you get, or are they still just gabla gabla gabla, random names? The containers when you say service. Yeah. So, so, uh, are, so you're talking about something like uh, maybe like something like it's set, it's set D, which has like it's has its own node identity and it wants to connect all of its own parts. Is that something similar to what you're asking? Yeah, it's actually Slurm. So there's going to be a Slurm CTLD, and then there's a bunch of Slurm workers. The Slurm CTLD should be called whatever because yeah. it's going to be named in the config file. And then it's nice if the others have a predictable naming pattern. I, I don't get the opportunity to do deployments very often, which is kind of ironic considering that I work on it. But um, <laughs> this, is <a> really <laughs> this is a really common problem, though, uh, that a lot of people want is these like, identities uh, on the service like this. Um, and there are some workarounds. Some people try creating a different service for every like, it replica of like it's set D, or I don't know much about Slurm, but I'm sure it works similarly. Um, and that's one way to do it. And then it has like a DNS entry that like you can always access it through. Um, 
It's tasks. Yeah, you can like yes. access the you can access something dot tasks and get like a list of all the IPs of the services in the cluster. Um, and we have an issue open, I believe, on Docker Docker about like I think people I saw want it. this kind of <laughs> this kind of thing, this kind of like stronger service identity and and persistence. Uh, so it's like something that we know about, but it's not something. It's something you have to use workarounds for right now. Okay. No, uh, can I just vote for that issue then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Consider your vote registered. Hey, Red Talk guys. Um, so my question is related to uh, health checks regarding nodes. Uh, so I've seen where if you deploy a bad service, uh, I, I'm thinking that maybe the uh, that Swarm interprets a service failure as a node failure because if you tell the node or the do uh, Docker logs for the cluster, you can actually see that it says it's underweighting a node. Uh, due to repeated service failures. So is that is that an actual thing? Because uh, I don't see that. Though. Yes. Yes. So w what's happening is that if your service uh, or if services on a node are repeatedly failing, then Swarm will treat that as something that might possibly be wrong with that node and just reduce it, its weight progressively in the scheduling algorithm. So while stuff might still go onto that node, it's going to have lower priority. And think of something like. Um, Let's say you have uh, maybe a plugin installed or not installed on a node and your service needs to use it, but your service instances keep getting sent to that node. And unless you've actually used uh, constraints or some other way or filters um, in your service, then there is no point sending this instance to that node. And so this is just a way for us to move scheduling these instances to a node where it's more likely to run. So then is it possible for, uh, say, a service A failure to affect service B if that service is, is on the same node then? Um, yes. yes. Uh, if, if the service is running, it's not going to be stopped, of course. But yeah, if, uh, e no matter what the services are, if there are progressive failures on the node, that node is going to continue to get downweighted in the scheduling algorithm, and it's going to be less yeah. and less likely that we're going to even try to schedule services to it. Gotcha. Cool. But it's temporary, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. <coughs> um, so um, we're, uh, my company, we're uh, now using Swarm in production. There's two features that we really love to have. I was just kind of wanted to know uh, uh, events on Swarm level. So now there's, you, you, can, you can have events on container level, but on Swarm level it would be really awesome. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, bin pack scheduling strategy. Uh, I know that the old Swarm had it. Uh, is there plans to put this in the new one? Um, Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes to vote. So uh, I'm not sure the exact status of it. Uh, these last couple of weeks, I haven't been keeping up with where things are moving. But for um, the first thing was events. Events. Yes. Uh, we didn't have time to put that in our presentation. Um, but yes, events are coming to Swarm. Yeah. And any any day now. I mean, pretty soon. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and, and the bin pack scheduling strategy is all. Is that also not yeah. in the pipeline right now? Yeah. Um, though it is worth noting that when we worked on the placement preferences, um, part of the proposal was that we, by default, we only have spread placement preference spread across these nodes. Right. Um, but we also considered, uh, like in the future, if we were to expand, we could use a similar technique to pack onto certain labels, preferably. Uh, so it's there's no feature and it's not like on the it's not on the roadmap right now, but the opportunity is open and we have it's open for us to do this at some point in the future without a lot of effort. Got it. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, not sure if this is in the purview of Swarm, but um, with like a service, you can specify a number of replicas. Is there a way to do that with a stack, like a set of services that kind of need to scale as a unit? I don't. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. So with the service, when we're updating it, um, and we have a lot of connections that are coming into it right now, is there a way that we can drain those active connections before we send it the stop command with like the mesh networking and the Do you know off? about start first versus stop first? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I believe there is a way, and I've heard discussions about it, and I know it's there, but I'm not sure about the finer details of how it's done. We, what but, you can do is you can set a, a preference on whether you want to start the new replica that you're going to first, or if you want to stop the, the old replica before you start the new one. And this doesn't guarantee that your connections will wrap up. Um, but when we kill nodes, we do it with SIGTERM, or we do not with SIGTERM, but with whatever's defined in the Docker file as like the yeah. stop signal. 
Um, so your option there is to like sort of define your stop so that you can kind of gracefully terminate these connections and they can get back on a different uh, replica. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, I have a question about Docker secrets. Do you show how simple it is to say Docker secrets and create a secret? You showed that the source of secret is a, a file. So in a CI CD, where does the file come from? Are there some best practices on making sure that file itself is secure and not checked into GitHub or Bitbuckets? Uh, right. So, so <laughs> just as a disclaimer, the yep. the stuff we demonstrated in this talk was really li like a very simple <laughs> sure. sort of. You can consider them toy examples, and sure. obviously there are uh, good practices to follow if you're actually deploying this. Yep. Um, so. Secrets are part of Swarm. So if you're if you're running if your CI/CD is running like services on a Swarm, mm -hmm. then you can just secret add. Um, if it's just running your service as a container, mm -hmm. you're going to have to figure out another way to put that file into the container. Yeah, stay, you can read from standard inf as for one thing. Yeah. Uh, but you, if you're not in Swarm, then you have to figure out how to get that file into the container yourself. Okay, thank you. A follow up on the secret itself. So I understand that the secrets are encrypted by Raft. That's true. And uh, uh, but secrets are distributed by masters to the services, right? Mm -hmm. And the masters are the ones that are storing the secrets in memory. Mm -hmm. Secrets on the services themselves are in temp of us. That that's not a problem. But what if all the masters get restarted? Where are the secrets? When when if if your entire Cluster gets right. restarted, including the masters. Right. Does the application come up? If so, where where would the secrets right. come up? So, at that so time? as I mentioned, uh, the the raft log, which is periodically written to disk, uh, is a way to back up the state of your cluster. And if your secrets have been in the in the managers when your raft uh, when the uh, last raft log was written, then that's where your secrets are stored. So if your entire cluster went down, then what you'd need to do is restart a new cluster using this existing log. And that's where your secrets will come up from. So will the master things. read the logs to find the secrets for each each service and then pump it into the service back? Yes. Like, will master refresh the memory based on when the uh, cluster went down last time? No, so no, no. So all of your so when all of your when all of your replicas die, your like cluster is sort of dead. Uh, and to bring it back up. Um, we, that log is not just like a dump of memory. That log is every single event that has happened in the swarm, right? And it, so you can reconstruct the entire cluster state from this log. And part of that cluster state is the secrets that you added. And so when you bring the cluster back up with these, with like bringing your managers back up, it's going to rebuild the whole cluster state. And if your services are down, it's going to start them back up and it's going to add the secrets. Yeah. So that raft log is everything you need to reconstruct the entire state of the cluster when the managers went down. So you yeah. don't have anything like a secret repository or a vault or anything like no. that? You don't need it. It's all no. encrypted anyway. It's, yeah. All right. And it's all distributed. Uh, this is about the ro replicas. If, when, we, when the swarm is in replica mode, can we make sure there's not more than one task is scheduled on the same node. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So, if I have, if I'm in replica mode, I have three node and I have three node, three replicas, and I don't want the same service to be more than one instance of that service to be run on the same node. So the placement, um, no, not just placement press. The high, the high availability scheduling algorithm uh, tries to, its best to spread that to spread that service out. So, like, if you only have one node available, like because the others are down or something, then it's they're both going to get placed on the same node. But we're going to try our best to spread it out across as many nodes as possible. We can't make any guarantees that we won't schedule more than one of a replica on a node. And if you need only one replica on nodes, you can use global services. And then you can set constraints on those global services so that they only get scheduled to certain nodes. And then they'll run on every single node that matches the constraint. We are using that with the global mode, but we would like to see if it can be possible with the replica mode in the coming versions. Yeah, we can't guarantee, but it's possible. You can sort of expect it, or you can hope for it, more than you could in the past. Any possible feature coming in the next coming versions? To Not to my knowledge, no. Um, all right, so, sorry folks, we're being kicked off the stage because the next talk is scheduled to begin. Um, but Drew and I will be around the con in the conference and I guess we'll be at the booths. Yeah, I'm going to be on booth duty uh, after this talk uh, and I'll be there 
all afternoon, I think. So feel free to come and talk to me directly. And there are going to be more people who are more knowledgeable than me who can help you with some of your more detailed questions.